Well, greetings, Pastor Eric here from Zion Lutheran Church in beautiful Redmond on day 20, chapter 20 of the Gospel of Luke. As we begin there, remember that Jesus had just cleansed the temple, and as a um, result of that, as a logical outcome of that, the religious leaders again rejected him and conflict arose. The beginning of chapter 20 reads this way. One day he was teaching the people in the temple and telling the good news. The people, okay? He's talking to the large crowds there. And the religious leaders tried to poke him and test him. And they asked him, where does your authority come from? Remember, the issue of authority has been won all throughout the Gospel of Luke. And they were teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, all those people. Whose authority are you acting by, they asked Jesus. Uh, whose authority, who gives you the authority to do such thing? So Jesus, the master question asker, asked him a question. Well, now by whose authority did John do his baptism? Now the religious leaders knew that they disapproved of the baptizing work of John the Baptist. However, John the Baptist was so popular among the people that they thought that if they negated the kind of baptism that he did, remember the baptism of repentance that they did again and again, turning their lives in the, in the right way, as more of not a once for all baptism, but a kind of a continuous thing, kind of like going to confession if you're Catholic or on Sunday morning with Lutherans, you know, just saying, man, I have fallen short. So they um, didn't want to answer that. The crowds venerated John the Baptist. The religious leaders were afraid to deny his authority. And so the implication is that since they weren't able to answer him, Jesus was cleansing the temple and teaching by the same authority that God himself had given to Jesus. In verses 9 through 19, Jesus goes to poke the hornet's nest even a little bit more. And he tells a parable to describe his authority. The parable about the vine was not new for the Israelites because Isaiah had used that same metaphor, that image, to refer to the people of Israel. So the symbolism of that would not have been lost on those who heard it. The owner of the vineyard sent three servants to gain fruit from the vineyard. They beat each one of the three. Finally, he, killed his, he sent his son, the vineyard owner, which represented Israel, and they killed him. They killed him. Jesus said, so what then will be done? What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He answered his own question. He will kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. That must have struck a knife in the heart of the leaders of the nation of Israel, knowing that Israel had been referred to by Isaiah, their venerated prophet, as the vineyard and God being the vine owners. So this little parable about them killing the son of the vineyard owner, obviously referring to Jesus, really represents the culmination of all of the teachings of Jesus uh, that we've seen so far that Gentiles and the outcasts will be added to the kingdom of God, whereas many people from the nation of Israel, from what was once the vineyard, would be cast out and unable to enter. They, the crowd responded with a strong statement saying, may it never be, um, but they recognized that Jesus was telling this parable directly at the religious leaders at the time and saying the Gentiles and outcasts will be welcomed into the kingdom. Then he um, tells them about the stone that the builders had thrown away. And actually, you know, when you make an arch, the one in the center is a capstone, the one holding the whole thing together. That's what you have rejected. And that's who I will be. Jesus' point was that the teachers of the law and the chief priests were all wrong. And what happened is they sought to kill him because they knew he had spoken his parable against him. But again, they feared the people. They feared the people, if you notice on, on chapter 20, verse 19, because they feared the people. The people who 
We're like children with uh, their noses pressed up against the door. The window of a candy shop knowing you want to get in but knowing not how to get in there. Here, they feared the people because they were interested in the message that Jesus was bringing. Verses 20 through 26, they were still afraid to uh, ask him many questions. So they said, well, what about uh, coins? Is it legal to pay taxes to Caesar? Trying to catch Jesus in, uh, in their question, Jesus essentially says, well, who's, whose name is on? Well, it, pay to Caesar what is due to Caesar, but give to God what is God. That is your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus uh, gets them in their question. And in fact, they use that answer against him in his trial, totally misrepresenting what Jesus wanted to say, saying that they said in his trial that Jesus opposed paying taxes to Caesar. In chapter 23, verse 2, we'll see that in a couple of days. Then there's a strange section in uh, verses 27 through 40 about the Sadducees who deny the resurrection. They're wondering about being married. A guy had seven wives and whatever, brothers, all that stuff. They come up with this hypothetical situation about who is going to be the guy's wife in heaven. Jesus really tries to um, not skirt their question, but saying, the resurrection and the time after that will be so different than what we have here that you can't quite use the same categories as what we have here with what we have in heaven. I mean, when we get resurrection resurrected, it's kind of like asking, are we going to be a three-year-old or an 85-year-old? The categories are different in heaven. They tried to catch him, but at the end of it, at the end in verse 40, they were afraid to ask Jesus any more questions because Jesus took their questions the way they asked them and turned them around against them. And really, they were asking questions made to entrap Jesus and Jesus, the master of answering and asking questions, turned everything around. Finally, in verses um, 41 and following, Jesus' words were designed not only to teach his disciples, but also to teach the crowds in verse 45. Um, he just kind of turns everything against them again, the flowing robes and the banquets. Um, Jesus says uh, that their pompous, lengthy prayers are hypocritical, and that those who did such things would be punished most severely because those who have the greater knowledge are held more accountable. And since they claim to have all this knowledge, Jesus turned the tables on him and said, if you miss who I am, you are having a supposed knowledge, but you really don't have it because you don't know me. So as we enter into chapter 21 through 24, as Jesus goes toward the cross and the trial, uh, trial and the cross and then the resurrection, the conflict has escalated and Jesus is going to the cross. It is a fascinating story, the way that Luke tells it. I hope you can kind of see some of the, some of the threads that we've been talking about over these last couple of weeks that now kind of come to culmination in these final chapters. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, but let's close in a prayer. Gracious, loving God, you are the Son of God. You are our Lord and Savior. We just pray that these words would sink into our hearts and minds, that Luke tells with such clarity and with such precision and with such insight into who Jesus was. Help us remember that he is Lord of our lives and that we are the ones who fall at his throne, fall at his feet, asking for forgiveness, knowing that we need repentance, and knowing that he is the one in whom lies eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow on day 21. See you then. Bye-bye.